Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can now see us online. I would like to welcome all the participants to this event, which is part of the Just Transition Virtual Week. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a session ready for us, uh, for you, <laughs> to update you about um, uh, what's going on with co-regions in the member states and at, at, at EU level about all the new initiatives uh, since, uh, since last April. Um, so first, I would like to also inform you that we have a slide already where well, it allows, allows you, you to ask, ask questions, questions uh, during, during our, our session, session and we will have, have time at the end to come, come back, back to, to, to the questions, questions which couldn't be answered uh, uh, directly uh, in the chat. chat. So um, please, uh, you'll, you'll see the, the, the code. If, if you go to Slido, you'll, you'll, you'll see this co-regions in transition updates, updates hashtag, hashtag before that, that which is the code. And if you put that one in Slido, you will be able to ask your questions or um, uh, to vote or to participate in an, an, any other way. So I would like to very much encourage you to, to use this possibility so that we, we get feedback and we can answer your questions and, and we see what, what are your concerns and, uh, and so on. So welcome again uh, to this, uh, to this uh, virtual event. And um, also be aware that we might we are recording uh, this event. Uh, so, um, so maybe we can, uh, we can move on. Uh, we start with a, with a quick update from, from the EU level about news relevant for just transition. Um, so very briefly, if I can have, please, uh, maybe I should introduce myself, sorry. Uh, my name is Adela Tesserova. I'm the head of unit in DG Energy, which is responsible for just transition. And we work, of course, closely with other parts of the commission, in particular DG Regio, who is uh, putting the just transition work in, in practice. Um, yeah, so I will update you from, from, let's say, from the just transition energy point of view, what is happening uh, at EU level. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So since April, um, we have, uh, there are three key developments I would like to mention. First is um, we have progressed very much at EU level with implementing the recovery plans. Uh, why is this relevant? Uh, because some of the recovery plans, for example, for Romania, make important just transition commitments. And of course, the financing related to recovery um, will be additional source of uh, finance in the case of these plans to support the just transition. So that's an important uh, development and we, have, uh, we will have intervention from Romania afterwards. Um, the second important development is that EU is putting in place legislation to implement our higher uh, target for uh, 2030. You know that uh, Europe has agreed to increase our climate ambition for 2030 to 55%. And um, this, of course, means a faster coal phase out. And legislation is being put in place to make this possible. So we are increasing the ambition for renewable energy. We are increasing the ambition for, uh, for energy efficiency. Uh, we are reviewing our climate legislation in parallel. Uh, the Commission proposed uh, to, um, uh, to introduce a new emission trading system for building and transport sectors and to compensate for any, uh, for any social impacts and to increase the just transition pillar of the Green Deal. Uh, the Commission is proposing a so-called social climate fund uh, to, uh, to have direct uh, funding to tackle energy poverty and other vulnerabilities. Uh, we are also progressing with the Just Transition programming. And uh, it, this is in full swing uh, in member states. We are receiving uh, different stages of draft Just Transition plans, um, closely linked to the recovery programming. And uh, so we, see, we hope to see very soon financing to start flowing uh, to the ground. Um, I see there's some problem with the slides. Um, I hope the organizers can fix that. Um, so to update you also, where are we with the coal phase out? You know, this has been a big topic at the COP. Um, I think we have now uh, changed the slides completely. <laughs> Can I have please back the, uh, the picture with the coal phase out? Thank you. Yes, so this has been a big topic at the COP in Glasgow. As you know, internationally, just transition is gaining on importance, uh, which is also, of course, reflected in the fact that at EU level, we have started the um, Western Balkans and Ukraine co-regions in transition project, 
um, to help our partners in Europe uh, phase out coal. Um, and you can see that in the EU, um, uh, we have some additional commitments in particular from Romania, and we expect uh, to hear soon from Bulgaria and Czech Republic. Um, so there is, a, there is certainly um, a speeding up of the coal phase out commitments in Europe. And um, okay, I think that is it with my, from my side. Yes. And um, before I give uh, the floor to our representatives of the member states to update you on, on, on their situation, I would like to invite uh, uh, Jose Moya, who is my colleague from the Commission's Joint Research Centre, uh, to update you on the, on the project that JRST has done about coal regions in transition, the benefits of, of the transition, and um, they have made important updates to their existing study to uh, expand it to peat and shale oil regions. They have also in parallel done a similar study for Western Balkans and Ukraine. Uh, so Jose Moya will, uh, will tell you about the updates regarding the, their project for the EU. The floor is yours, Jose. Thank you. Uh, we don't hear you, Jose. Sorry, uh, I'm working. Thank you, Adela. I'm working on the uh, Knowledge for Energy Union in GRC Petten, and I'm going to present to you uh, our uh, previous to the last I mean, uh, update of the previous report that we had. In the next slide, you see all the work, uh, all the work that we have done in support of the careers in transition. The report that I'm going to present to you is the third one of a series of four. The latest one contains a similar scope to the first and third one, but for the Western Balkans and Ukraine, as Adela uh, has uh, already anticipated. And in this third one that I'm going to describe to you uh, is an update of the first one uh, that describes the uh, core regions in transition. But this one, in difference to the uh, first one, contains also for peat and oil shale regions. The second one of which I will bring up uh, in the conclusions uh, one of the main findings quantifies the uh, clean energy opportunities that the, the opportunities that clean energy technologies comes uh, bring to these coal regions in transition. On the next slide, uh, we can already see the coal sector uh, in which we have, well, on the map, you see the coal mines that had some kind of prohibition were active by 2018. The point is that uh, our later report uh, contains the updated information, or consolidated information about coal mines. Uh, that is from 2018. The previous report was from a the previous report from 2018 con con uh, commented consolidated data from 2015 and 2016. For po coal power plants, we have more recent data, but uh, we don't mix all of them together in the same slide. Just only. Uh, we put the data for 2018 and in parallel with the coal mines. So here you see that by 2018, there were 90 coal mines in 11 member states, 440 uh, coal production, uh, hard coal and lignite, and there were one, close to 180 coal four plants in 130. On the slide, we present the employment in the coal sector the total amount was 160 in coal mining, while practically 50,000 in coal power plants. Uh, there was a lot of variability in the member states. In mining, for example, the country with the lowest number of employees was 160, and the, max, the, num the country with the highest number of employees Poland, uh, was Poland with 91,000 employees. In coal power plants, a similar situation. Uh, for the low range, in, with Hungary having the lowest uh, number of employees there, and the highest is Poland, or again, with 15,600. Uh, 15, there is also an estimation of the indirect employment that is around 131. On the next slide, we have also uh, the results for PID. PID is, uh, on the figure you see the employment in PID, is identified in six countries, Finland is the country with the largest number of employees in the in PID, uh, with 4,000 out of the 6,300 that you see at the bottom of the slide. The production was 9 million tons of PID, and we identified 208 PID fire power plants, uh, plus additional uh, 139 of the small boilers in Finland. 
Uh, the following country with, uh, according to the number of employees, was Sweden, followed by Estonia, Sweden 1,000, Estonia 7,000, and Ireland 300. The use of PID uh, in the report is uh, we comment on only uh, uh, on the uh, energy use of PID. We exclude out of the scope of the report other uses of PID. The PID use for energy purposes uh, varied uh, in the countries. For example, it was practically used for heat in Finland, but uh, uh, on the other hand, in Ireland, was practically used for electricity production. On the next slide, we present the results from our shale. It is concentrated in one single country in Estonia, but you see there that the production is practically twice the value of peat production for energy use in Europe in the previous slide. We identified six shale fire power plants and employment is 5,200 people. On, this, on the figure, you can see that the variability, the variability in the uh, capacity of uh, oil shale power plants that goes from 1.6 gigawatts to some tens of megawatts. On the next slide, we present all together in one single table the results from the first report that comes from uh, use the data from 2015 or 2016. And you see there in the number of mines, the variation has been 30% decrease or 30% and in direct jobs the decrease is 10 percent so that means that the mines closed were not the ones with a higher number of employees the decrease in capacity is has gone hand in hand in the number of plants with the capacity and also with direct, direct jobs it's around 15 and 18 percent respectively so in the next slide we present the results of the risk quantified by 2030 in this report. Uh, for 2030, we consider two, two uh, scenarios, one from the National Energy and Climate Plans and the other one from uh, the 10 years network development plans. The values from the uh, National Energy and Climate Plans are much lower. You see that the regions most affected is in Bulgaria with 5,500 employees while in the 10 years network development plan, the regions with higher number of employees are rich is Upper Silesia in Poland. That this region doesn't appear in the National Energy Economy Plan as one as the highest, that these are the ones in Romania. But the situation is more spread about, let's say, the following. Uh, there are several regions in West, in Romania, Southwest Oletia, Dikiti, Macedonia, Kohl, that had a very similar names so in both scenarios of the Oppasurix. As a key findings in the next slide, we present the, yeah, in next slide, please. Yeah, uh, the first one, the previous one. That is, yeah, we have two slides with conclusions and that is our conclusion. Where we are collecting all the messages that we said previously. There are core activities in 19 member states, amounting the employment amounted up, up to 208,000 people. There are peak provision in six countries, amounting to uh, the, uh, the employment uh, to around 6,000 uh, people. Oil share activities are only in Estonia, uh, located primarily in the border, in the nor northeast border with Russia, in giving employment, direct employment to 5,000 people. From 2010 to 2018, the lignite production decreased by 20% and the hardcore production by 40% respect, uh, with the closure of 82 mines. This number of uh, mines closed is very similar to the number of mines that remain open by 2018. That was in the previous slide was 90 uh, open mines by 2018. The coal mining jobs decreased by 20, 32%. On the next slide, we have the results for the coal fire power plants, and we see that from 2016 to 2020, more than 60 gigawatts of coal power capacity has retired. Um, by 2030, we estimated that uh, two thirds of the capacity, existing capacity by 2020 will be retired. We also quantified the ra uh, range for the jobs and rigs between 20 20 and 2030, and that this goes to from 50 to 100 and around to 110 jobs and the, uh, under two very different scenarios. The jobs are associated for energy 
use in bid is only a re immediate risk in Ireland. There are other countries for which there are risks in, in a longer term. For example, uh, Finland that has plans to uh, remove uh, fossil fuels from the heat production by 2030, but the imminent risk is only in Ireland. But I want to conclude this uh, presentation with a no, um, one of the conclusions that we took from the second report that I presented at the beginning, that the clean energy, uh, the clean energy technologies offer a uh, wide room for, of, in, let's say, alleviation for these core regions in transition and could create up to 300,000 jobs by 2030, um, practically half a million by 2050, just only the identified core regions. This is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, and I think your conclusion is important because, of course, we need to understand uh, the trends. Uh, but if we also need to understand that these jobs are not just job losses, but there is a future for these employees and that, in fact, the co-regions in transition initiative offers new future. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for workers who are losing jobs with the transition. Thank you very much. So in, uh, in our uh, next session, um, I will pass the floor to representatives of three member states who have origins from member states who have um, a particularly um, relevant updates for you. So we have invited Greece, Slovakia and Romania today. Um, and I would also like to encourage you to use the opportunity and ask questions. We will not have a question and answer session immediately after this session, but we will have it at the end. So if you have questions to our three panelists now, please uh, use Slido to ask them. And uh, now I will pass the floor to Alexandra Mavrogonatu, who comes from Greece and is uh, the, uh, te represents the technical secretariat of the Greek uh, uh, steering committee for just transition. And uh, she will tell us more about what's going on in Greece because Greece has making huge progress. Uh, it has been making huge progress recently. So, Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. Uh, good afternoon, Paul. Uh, today, I will try to give you a brief update on the progress made uh, in Greece in terms of uh, planning, implementation, and combining resources for the energy transition. Next slide, please. I will start this presentation uh, referring to what the energy transition uh, is about in Greece. Uh, as a key step for this transition in my country was uh, the a commitment our government uh, took in order to decommission all Ignite power plants by 2028, as well as to phase out by 2029 the autonomous power stations which are located in the islands and use a diesel or heavy fuel oil. As you can see in the map, uh, this commitment uh, affected most uh, the region of Western Macedonia, the area of Megalopolis, and also uh, the regions of Aegean Islands, North and South, and uh, Crete. Uh, main goal uh, for these areas during the transition is to support local economies and uh, employment and minimize the associated social and environmental impacts that are coming from this uh, transition. Next slide, please. <coughs> Knowing what the energy transition stands for in Greece, uh, the planning procedures that we followed were scheduled in two levels. At level uh, one, and according to the timetable of the energy transition that we said before, a comprehensive and quantified national transition plan uh, was created, uh, which was uh, combining the following elements. Uh, it had a clear vision for the next day. It has a clear vision for the next day. Uh, it will support, it will be supported by real investments. It will provide a comprehensive set of incentives. It will mobilize private national, national and EU funds and uh, will provide a reskilling upskilling of the human resources. Next slide. This first level of planning led uh, to the preparation of the Just Transition Development Plan. Uh, that is a, an integrated national strategic scheme, a national master plan, let's call it, towards a climate neutral and circular economy according to the provisions of the National Energy and Climate Plan. The next day's vision of this 
a national master plan is to promote the sustainable development and prosperity of the citizens in the affected areas by utilizing the competitive advantages each of, the, of these areas has uh, in the, the five growth pillars that you see uh, in the slide. Clean energy, manufacture, small industries and trade, small agricultural production, sustainable tourism, technology and education. These pillars are additionally supported by four categories of horizontal actions, uh, which namely are structural and digital infrastructure, reskilling and skilling of the human resources, entrepreneurship guidance and motivation, and new and alternative lab uses. Next slide, please. At the second level, uh, the vision of the growth pillar of uh, the National Master Plan had to be tailored to the needs and specific characteristics uh, of each one of the affected areas uh, according to the just transition mechanism and to the eligibilities this mechanism has. Uh, in our case, this need uh, led to the preparation of three distinct territorial uh, just transition plans. We call it uh, territorial plans to be more easy. Uh, one for Western Macedonia, one for uh, the area of Megalopolis and the neighboring areas of uh, Tripolis, uh, Gortinia, Ichalia, and one for the South and North Aegean Islands and Crete. Furthermore, uh, these three uh, territorial plans uh, constituted the base for the preparation of the Just Transition Development Program under the Greek Partnership Agreement for 2021 and 2027 programming period. Next slide. As for the implementation of the Just Transition Development Plan, during the planning procedure, it came up how crucial it was for this plan to promote not only the public and private investments, but also the public-private partnership investments. Next slide. Another issue that we had to deal uh, during uh, the planning procedure and, uh, according, and uh, in, in, um, in regard to the implementation process was the need uh, to determine the key actions that could facilitate the implementation program, uh, progress of uh, the National Master Plan. And uh, from this aspect, the key issues that uh, were identified as uh, the most important in our case was the following, which are to ensure adequate funding resources, to define and enact new land uses in the uh, ex-mining areas that are to be transferred to the state. And uh, for this purpose, we chosen as the best practice, the preparation of, the spe of spe special urban plans in these areas to attract and facilitate the establishment of new enterprises and uh, to enhance the function of the existing ones, to identify and promote legal provisions that are necessary to facilitate the licensing procedures of the investment, and also, last but not least, to create a tank of projects eligible and properly mature to be funded by the Just Transition Mechanism and the other available resources. Next slide. Something else that we had to take uh, into account during uh, the implementation, according to, uh, for the implementation of the plan, was the need to define and combine all available resources. For this purpose, except of the funds that are under the Just Transition Mechanism, which means uh, the Just Transition Fund, the Invest EU Initiative and the EIB Loan Facility, we realized that we had to combine also resources from the Recovery and Resilience Fund, the other uh, EU structural funds such as uh, ERDF, ESF, uh, Cohesion Fund and the uh, European Agricultural Fund. And uh, of course, uh, we had to also uh, combine uh, national resources from the Greek Public Investment Programme and the Green Fund. Next slide. As for the Just Transition Mechanism resources, uh, it was also crucial to determine the synergies and complementarities between the three pillars. In other words, we had to specify the additional fields in which the support of Pillar 2 and Pillar 3 should be directed. So, uh, for pillar, uh, pillar 3, uh, in our case, we support investments that are highly complementary to the Just Transition Program for 2020-2027 uh, programming periods, such as uh, new roads, 
uh, and rail projects, water infrastructures and networks, wastewater and solid wastewater management infrastructures, and so on. While from Pillar 2, uh, pillar, funds from Pillar 2 will be used to support microfinance needs in micro enterprises, as well as investments that are technically and economically sustainable, mainly in the areas of transport, energy production, tourism and manufacturing, uh, and so on. Next slide, please. In this slide, uh, you can see our attempt to correlate the various types and categories of projects that are envisaged by the National Master Plan to the available funding resources. For, for example, you can see that uh, projects uh, which are related uh, to the land restoration and land repurposing uh, are, are scheduled to be funded by resources of RRF and the Just Transition Fund. Next slide, please. This is the last slide of my presentation, and uh, I've tried to summarize the state of play regarding the planning, implementation, and combining resources of the National Master Plan. So, in terms of planning, uh, till now we have the approval of the National Master Plan on December 2020, uh, while the Just Transition Program and the combining three territorial, mass, uh, territorial plans have been uh, officially submitted to the European Commu uh, Commission uh, on the 12th of October uh, in order to, to be approved. Uh, in uh, terms of implementation, uh, various legal actions still now have been uh, promoted, uh, of which most important to refer, uh, it is uh, the law uh, 7459 of uh, 2020, uh, with which we established the meaning of delignification zones, uh, the core of these uh, delignification zones, as well as the provision of two framework program contracts between uh, PPC and the Greek state, and also uh, the elaboration of three new draft laws about uh, strategic investments, investment incentives, and the governance scheme of the national master plan. In terms of combining resources now, uh, through Pillar 1, uh, we have managed to allocate 1.63 billion euros of the Greek Partners Agreement for the new programming period to the Just Transition Program, while under uh, Pillar 3, an MOU between EIB and the Greek Ministry of Environment and Energy has been signed, uh, giving the opportunity to the Greek authorities to activate uh, 325 million euros of the funding capacity of the EIB uh, loan facility. Further to that, 300 million euros uh, of the national RRF plan have been insured for restoration works in the lands affected by the mining activity and are to be transferred to the state, the Greek state. Finally, in regards to the national resources, uh, 30 million euros per year from the Green Fund are used for investments exclusively in the areas affected by the closure of lignite mines and plants while uh, until now around uh, 10 million euros uh, will be used to mature public investments that are eligible by the EU funds. That was, uh, uh, Adela, my brief update on how the energy transition process in Greece uh, is developed uh, uh, up to now. And I would like to thank everyone for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, very interesting. I mean, Greece is super advanced in the planning, and I think we also that you have a, a very sophisticated system how you manage to combine different EU funds for just transition and, and basically increase the envelope for just transition from across all the available funding. This is impressive. So well done and good luck with the finalization. Um, so now we move to Slovakia, and uh, our next speaker is uh, speaker is Peter Balík. Uh, Director General uh, for Innovation, Strategic Investment and Analysis at the Slovak Ministry for Regional Development. Yes, and thank you. go ahead. Yes, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to, to everyone. Uh, so in my short presentation, I would like to speak about our case study relate, related to the JTF uh, implementation in Slovakia. Uh, as you know, Slovakia is in a close proximity with neighboring countries such as Poland, Czech Republic, where just transition and the coal region in transition is also a very 
accurate and very topical uh, issue. So there is a lot of negotiation, a lot of coordination going on also with our partners across the across the borders. But now I would like to focus on uh, on uh, the case of uh, Slovakia. If we can start with the first slide, um, the total allocation of the Just Transition Fund in Slovakia from the first pillar is 459 million euro. Originally, there were four regions considered as eligible ones. Right now, we have two confirmed. It is uh, one region in the west and one region in the east. Uh, there are ongoing discussions um, about uh, a region in the middle of Slovakia, namely the Banska Bystrica region, uh, which is not yet confirmed as a, an eligible region for the just transition. The case that we are trying to make with the European Commission is that Banska Bystrica already went through a transformation in the past. Uh, there was uh, uh, a very active mining activity going on in this region as well. The mines were shut down uh, some years ago. However, the socio-economic impacts that the Just Transition Fund attempts to tackle are still present in, in this region. So there are still ongoing discussions regarding uh, one region to be confirmed as an eligible one uh, for the Just Transition Fund in Slovakia. The last region, Bratislava region, the capital region has been um, named or confirmed as not eligible for the Just Transition Fund, despite there are uh, significant CO2 emissions, but these are mainly from, uh, from, uh, from transport. Uh, in the Upper Nitra region, which is eligible, we have uh, large mines. There are 2,500 miners uh, working in the mining industry and additional hundreds of uh, uh, associated stuff in the uh, mining uh, industry. So the socioeconomic uh, effects in the Upper Nitra region will be significant, especially after uh, 2023 uh, when uh, the utilization of uh, of coal and the extraction of coal in the upper Nitra region will be ceased. There is a government decree which already phased out coal uh, utilization in Slovakia from 2023. So there will be no extraction and no burning uh, of coal in the upper Nitra region going on post 2023. So it's a very sensitive uh, decision which is going to have, of course, uh, tremendous uh, socio-economic impacts, but this is what we are attempting to do with the help of the Just Transition Fund. The second eligible region, as I mentioned, in the east uh, is, is represented by uh, a strong, heavy industry, metallurgic uh, production, namely the US steel, which is producing uh, uh, steel uh, based on burning uh, coal and it's employing approximately 10,000 uh, employees. However, due to uh, a transition, uh, US Steel is uh, aiming to transform its uh, production processes and uh, phase out the utilization of coal and, uh, and rather use alternative sources uh, of energy, which of course might have an impact also on the number of employees due to an optimization. So there, there are also risks that um, the this transition is going to have an effect on the socio-economic situation in the Košice region uh, as well. If we can move to the second slide, um, a lot is being uh, said about programming, the preparation of the program uh, of the partnership agreement of the operational program and the TJTP, of course. And this is, of, of course, our priority. We are about to submit our first official version of the TJTP to the European Commission in the course of November. However, what I would like to stress and what we also um, uh, hear a lot from our colleagues in the European Commission is that we need to focus on project intents. Uh, this is our, I would say, biggest uh, priority. Uh, because, uh, as you know, 60% of the Just Transition Fund is composed of NGEU sources, which means that by the end of 2023, we need to contract 60% of resources and implement them by the end of 2026. And this gives us a huge pressure in terms of uh, project uh, preparation. That's why in Slovakia, in March this year, we have decided to uh, collect uh, project fishes, not only the names of project, but but well-developed project fishes of project intentions uh, from the eligible uh, regions. Uh, and in this, we call it unofficial informal call for proposals. 
uh, the beneficiaries were supposed to fill in a description of the of the project intents, the approximated uh, amount of investments, uh, the technical feasibility of the project, the financial sustainability, uh, and also other aspects related to uh, related to the implementation and the stage of the preparation of of these projects. This gave us a good understanding about the demand in the in the eligible regions right now we are actually evaluating these project fishes we received approximately 430 project fishes out of which uh, uh, approximately 300 are eligible uh, from or or uh, are eligible based on the regulation on uh, on jtf uh, so there is a huge pool of uh, well-developed project fishes that we are currently working with and uh, these projects can be actually uh, split into three main pillars that um, we are going to focus on in terms of the implementation and also in terms of the programming. The first pillar is the economic diversification of uh, the eligible territories with a strong focus on, on RDI, uh, small and middle-sized enterprises, startups and um, co-working uh, centers digitalization of uh, SMEs and uh, the support for uh, innovative uh, jobs, which will help to diversify local economies. The second uh, pillar is the sustainable environment uh, pillar, which is which is focusing on the circular economy, increasing the energy efficiency of uh, public buildings. A lot is being proposed uh, also in the area of hydrogen using hydrogen buses and hydrogen public transport um, in in these particular regions and of course uh, the re renewable energy uh, projects uh, have a huge demand in in these uh, in these regions and the third pillar is the quality of life and social infrastructure pillar which of course is uh, an important uh, aspect of the just transition especially with respect to the socio-economic uh, impacts that we expect in the eligible regions we would like to focus on the support for new skills, upskilling of um, uh, first the existing staff that was working in the mining industry, but also on, on young talents. We would like to uh, provide resources for the support of uh, social care because approximately 50% of people working in a mining industry and heavy industry sectors uh, are over 55 years old. That's why social care and pension care is uh, an, an important aspect that we would like to uh, focus the resources from uh, JTF um, in. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have approximately 300 project fishes that we are currently dealing with. We are evaluating them and we will support the project preparation of uh, of the uh, chosen uh, project fishes. Uh, the evaluation is being done with help of our colleagues uh, in uh, in Jaspers and also with the help of technical assistance that was given to us by the DG uh, reform uh, within the uh, remits of the uh, technical support uh, instrument. So right now there is a lot of focus in Slovakia already on the preparation of uh, projects. We expect that the first official calls from JTF will be published in the course of next year, probably mid or second half of next year and by then we would like to have the strategic or flagship projects um, uh, ready and that's why we are giving a lot of importance on the project uh, preparation and we of course know from our experience that the project preparation is a is a bottleneck in the in the regions and on the local level uh, that's why we are uh, trying to be in a regular uh, touch with the local authorities and potential beneficiaries and uh, helping them with technical assistance to develop well-prepared uh, projects next slide please uh, the preparation and programming and the implementation of the just transition fund in slovakia will flow uh, or will happen based on a close participatory uh, process. We have um, uh, local and regional working groups uh, established on the regional level embedded in the partnership councils, which are preparing the uh, integrated territorial investment strategies for, for each region. So we want to see a lot of collaboration and synergies between projects that are 
being proposed on the regional uh, level and that's why the JTF working groups have been embedded in these partnership uh, councils so that beneficiaries for the JTF and beneficiaries for other resources such as structural funds are well uh, coordinated. On the national level, we have an interministerial working group. So each ministry that has a say about just transition, such as the Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Social Affairs, Environment, Finance, Education, etc., they all are members of this interministerial working group, uh, where we are discussing the project intents, where we are also evaluating project intents and discussing the potential strategic projects that we would like to start the. Uh, allocation of JTF uh, with. And uh, last but not least, um, uh, in our participatory, participatory process, the, um, the role of the youth and young people is also an important uh, element. We have prepared, uh, se prepared several workshops and online service with, uh, with the youth from the regions on how they uh, see the transition in their eyes, how they see the, the future of their region, where they would like to uh, operate uh, in the future so that we also avoid uh, further migration from, from these regions, which is a particular problem in the eligible JTF regions in, in Slovakia. If we can move to the, to the next slide, there is some more detail presented on the participation of uh, youth in the preparation of the JTF. Um, we we have a continuous process of work uh, with young people they are helping us in the in the program preparation the preparation of the tjtp and we will also involve them in the future implementation of uh, specific uh, specific uh, measures as well as we are preparing some specific projects and measures to be granted directly to young people in uh, in these regions to support uh, social projects in their local community to to improve the attractiveness uh, of the region so uh, if i would name our main priorities within uh, within jtf first of course we need to finish uh, the negotiations on the programming with the European Commission. This is, of course, an important part, but it's an absolute necessary uh, part which each member state needs to needs to fulfill. Uh, second is the uh, project preparation. Uh, we think that due to the 60% uh, of next generation EU resources in the JTF, there is uh, an adequate pressure on the member states to start with dealing with, uh, with projects on top of uh, the programming. And that's why we have started um, uh, a really uh, big attempt to to identify uh, well prepared projects and we are trying to include and involve our partners from various technical assistances across Europe, namely namely uh, Jaspers, as I mentioned, and also the instrument from uh, DG reform and last but not least uh, for us uh, what is an important aspect in the just transition is, is as i mentioned the participatory participatory process we have a institutionalized structure um, established on the regional level as i mentioned on the national level but also with uh, with the youth and these are of course priorities for us thank you very much thank you very much Peter. very interesting um I didn't say at the beginning, but I think you all saw it, that Slovakia is um, is the most advanced country in the Central and Eastern Europe, and that was very clear from your presentation. So again, good luck to you for finalizing your territorial just transition plans. We look forward to seeing the drafts. Um, and now we move uh, to Romania. Uh, we don't have representative of the Romanian government, but we have a representative of uh, one of the key regions, uh, the Juvali. Uh, with us is Alin Shipanu, superior referent of the Gorsh Country Council, who will um, uh, tell you an uh, update from, from his region. So, Alin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank you on behalf of uh, Gorsh County Council for giving us the opportunity to um, to be here and to present ourselves. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we are one of the six uh, counties which benefits from the JTF uh, in Romania and um, 
one of the key um, counties in this process because uh, we have a history with uh, with the uh, coal mining and wind uh, energy produced using it as fuel. For the past uh, century, between 1940 and 1960 until now, uh, we have covered about 30% of Romania's um, total production of energy over the entire country. So um, if there's anything we're kind of proud of uh, as um, people of Gosh County is that modern Romania was somehow built to a certain degree uh, thanks to our miners and our engineers. I've chosen to uh, start with, um, with this image because it's uh, quite impactful and uh, it uh, represents our plans and uh, the actual situation we're in and what we want to do next. Um, because this, um, this image, this um, contribution we had to the um, uh, production of uh, energy in Romania uh, brought us somehow a, um, a nickname, if you want. We are known as the heart of Romania's energy system. It's, uh, it's part of our history and our legacy, which we intend to keep, but not as everyone expects. Next slide, please. You know, being, um, you know, gaining our pride of being what we are today made us um, a little weak on other aspects, especially our economy. Uh, having these uh, colossus, these um, you know, coal mines, these energy producers in Gorsh County um, made us unaware of the, uh, the changes uh, around Europe, around the world, and um, we kind of forgot what uh, a healthy economic system and um, development in business sector really means. So most of the businesses uh, developed in Gorsh County were focused uh, mainly on these, um, these sectors, the mining sector and the energy production sector. So that led us uh, today with low economic diversity, a few business opportunities and major dependency on coal mining and energy production. Um, also, 70% of Gorsh County's economy revolves around coal energy production. Um, the entire county's GDP is covered almost 40 two percent by Ultenia Energy Complex and the first 120 companies which work for it out of 6,700 companies registered in Gorsh County. So it's a huge number. Um, the problem, the frightening part is that coal mining and the solid fuel energy are on the brink of extinction. So if this colossus will fall, our entire economy will, uh, will follow along. Next slide, please. So as we started out working on uh, on the JTF uh, on the um, uh, GTP, the Just Transition Plan for Gush County, uh, we thought the best way to survive and to have um, a healthy or at least partially healthy economy is to make a radical change, and uh, that radical change is linked to what I was. Um, telling you at, from, at the beginning of my presentation is keeping our legacy. Uh, we had a, a, a vision um, that emerged during the, uh, the process of uh, writing and gathering information for the, uh, the Just Transition Plan. And that um, uh, vision was to become from the uh, heart of Romania's uh, energy uh, energy system to become the green heart of, of uh, Romania's energy system. And that's because based on um, the data we, we've gathered, um, we have about uh, 3000 megawatts of um, total power, uh, total solar power installed by the end of 2030, if all the projects regarding this kind of, uh, of energy are implemented. So, Taking this into account, we started making um, a, um, a plan for the entire county and the change of vision, not just regarding uh, solar energy, but uh, becoming, if we can, the first green county in Romania by the end of uh, 2030. And that means uh, the most uh, solar powered um, uh, producers in, in the entire county, the most uh, charging station in the entire county or uh, country, or 
the most public uh, buildings or private buildings uh, which uh, use the solar panels as uh, uh, as main or, um, or as main source of energy and so on uh, the idea is next slide please the idea is, is, is not just a vision or a simple uh, guess we had because uh, just uh, uh, our like our friends in Slovakia we thought it would be a Better, better idea to not just uh, hint or try to guess what uh, the investments uh, needs are uh, financeable through, through JTF. So we started the public survey, a public survey that um, during the course of uh, two months, we, we gathered 276 project uh, ideas and over 75% of these project ideas are revolving around pro power production and energy, energy efficiency. So um, this uh, hunger, if you like, for uh, solar power or for green energy uh, made us um, take that this decision of creating a brand for Gorsh County, uh, a green uh, Gorsh uh, by the end of 2030. So it's... it's uh, somehow at the beginning because um, we are aware that the JTF and uh, mostly the first pillar of the JTF is uh, mainly focused on um, on SMEs and SMEs are survivors so the problem is what do we do next uh, next slide please the problem is that if we only use the, the JTF funds for um, financing um, small businesses or um, businesses that don't necessarily provide a, uh, a base for a, for a healthy economy, we wouldn't have uh, much of a success. So we try to use the, the JTF funds, even this uh, brand I was talking to you earlier about, and make a market out of it you know uh, if we need uh, 3000 megawatts of total installed power uh, through uh, solar panels by the end of 2030 probably somehow along the way in one two years from now someone will think about making a factory for solar panels in Gorsh County so we're kind of thinking uh, on the entire economic chain and this doesn't revolve only around solar panels. It revolves uh, also around uh, the energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, we had um, a lot of help from our colleagues from uh, Greenpeace, uh, which um, you know, who founded uh, through Energy Policy Group Romania, a study. And this study showed us that uh, the necessity for um, uh, energy efficiency in buildings uh, rises up to uh, about 7.5 billion Romanian lei, so 2.5 billion euros. So if we invest this uh, amount of money, which uh, energy efficiency in buildings is uh, financeable through JTF. So if we um, start using these funds in order to create that market I was told, telling you about, we can somehow uh, extend the entire uh, economic chain up to the, um, the factories, the main producers for the raw materials, for the construction materials, for, uh, you know, uh, like I told you earlier, solar panels and so on. And last but not least, uh, and this was a difference uh, in uh, in our way of thinking. Uh, the jobs and the um, the qualification process, the re uh, qualification process, we left it uh, somehow as a consequence. Uh, first, we want to know where uh, the money for uh, for the investments will go in order to see how many. Uh, um, funds we need and how many uh, how diverse the uh, the um, the market for for employees will be so as of now we have almost um, based on the the research i was telling you about about 25000 to 30000 jobs uh, if those projects will be implemented uh, and i'm talking only about jtf and Moving forward, uh, we're going. We're, we will try to use uh, these uh, markets, these uh, necessities on the uh, uh, solar panel production, the uh, energy efficiency, um, 
uh, economic chain and try to attract uh, large companies which are interested in uh, f uh, developing uh, businesses in Gorsh County. Because, like I said, if we have now 70% of the local economy based on only one producer of energy, only one Colossus, it will be very hard in the next eight to 10 years to find something in order to replace it. So this is our strategy as of now. Um, we're trying to um, uh, implement this idea at the government level, these uh, economic chains uh, in the try to find a way to mobilize the, uh, the local business uh, market in order to access the funds. Because we are in, um, we're in quite a mess right now in the future if we don't uh, manage to um, uh, get everyone along in the in this ride it's not going to be quite bright as it was thank you very much thank you very much um this was uh, uh, this was uh, very interesting i mean um, romania is taking uh, important uh, commitments at national level but it's important to see and thank you alan for that that um at, at the local level, uh, there is so much work going on. And so um, all the best. And thank you very much thank again. You. Thank you. Um, before we get to the question and answer session, and we have already some questions for our panelists, um, we still have one, um, one session uh, of important updates for you. Those are more from the EU level, uh, let's say from the initiatives that we are taking um, uh, with our implementing for the co-regions and transition. So we have three updates for you. First, we have set up uh, the Commission and the EIB, a new technical assistance uh, instrument. So we will present that to you. Second, um, we have set up an exchange program for co-regions in transition. So you will hear about that. And third, we have a new um, technical guidance on, on financing instruments for co-regions in transition. Uh, so you will hear about that. Um, so first, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to have uh, the possibility to present to you Target, together with my colleague from the EIB, Antonio Almagro, who is a director of the European Investment Bank. And uh, we will briefly uh, guide you through this new technical assistance instrument. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this new technical assistance instrument is called Target. And uh, you know very well that we already have this uh, instrument called START, which provides technical assistance to core regions to help them with the planning and programming. The new instrument called Target uh, will help core regions to build capacity to implement concrete projects. And it is a joint initiative of the Euro European Commission and the European Investment Bank. Next, please. What will target finance? So we'll finance technical assistance to support clean energy and energy efficiency projects in the coal, peat and oil shale regions of the EU. So in this way, um, while just transition is about addressing the socioeconomic fallout of the transition uh, target, will help you with the energy transition projects. Why is this important for Just Transition? These projects create a lot of jobs. We have, we have heard it from Aline, for example, from, from uh, Romania. So uh, clean energy and energy efficiency can create a lot of jobs. That's why uh, this, uh, this new technical assistance project to support uh, the Just Transition in the co-regions. And for example, to help co-regions to access the financing from InvestEU. And now I'm handing over to Antonio for the next slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I have to say it's a pleasure to, to have this joint presentation with DGNR uh, presenting basically this new joint facility that, that we have um, we have set up for, for beneficiaries in coal regions. This builds in, uh, on, on, on the long experience of um, cooperation between Commission and the Bank on, on several uh, initiatives, basically to provide technical advice on projects and, and help beneficiaries to, to, to get projects to maturity that can uh, benefit from funding from, from different uh, uh, facilities. So, so obviously, in the case in this particular case, uh, DGNR and the Bank share a common goal of uh, decarbonizing the energy sector. 
and I think the fitting the, this this facility fits very well into into these objectives. Um, the idea the idea of this facility is to to support beneficiaries on the early stages of a, of a project development. Uh, because in, in particularly the, depending on the type of beneficiaries uh, we go to, this is sometimes a more critical part just to to find the right projects um, to be developed uh, further. So that's uh, the, the main the main goal. So we we support the projects on the early early stages of development. Uh, we we will help also to find suitable uh, um, sources of financing for for those projects because there are plenty of um, uh, financing opportunities uh, around either in terms of uh, of grants in terms of loans and the bank being one of the lenders to, to the sector and and finally in some projects also when when we cannot find um, uh, another facility already in place that might uh, might support the the, the the finalization of the project and the full development of the project. Uh, funds from Target could be also used to um, to develop the, um, those um, those projects. So basically, that's what you have here in this in these bullets. I mean the the different the different stages. Um, so that implies a close relation uh, with beneficiaries, um, just to hand by hand and just to to, to try and find these projects. Um, provides uh, implies also providing advice and guidance to to um, to improve the quality of the projects and to accelerate uh, their maturity. Um, as I said, to to provide the the guidance also to to identify sources of funding and, um, and to build capacity also on the beneficiaries because this support is is done is done is is done normally between with joint teams between between the, the dedicated team in Jaspers and I will elaborate on that in a minute and the dedicated team by the beneficiaries. So these teams work together and that, um, by experience, that contributes to, to a transfer of knowledge between between, uh, between the teams and, and sometimes it goes both ways. I mean, we learn a lot from the beneficiaries that we work with. And, and as I said, um, in, in some cases, we can even help in, in to, to finalize the, the preparation of the projects with funding from, from the facility. Uh, the beneficiaries, and as explained, I think already, but uh, in any case, uh, the beneficiaries are are local and regional authorities in in uh, in regions that that basically uh, are dedicated uh, to a large extent at the moment to coal, peat, oil, peat, and, and oil and shale um, activities, and and these regions have to to transition into into other sources of energy so the, the target is um, basically supporting the preparation of renewable energy projects energy efficiency projects and um, and and within the condition basically that we we already um, we already uh, explained uh, next slide please um, the the model we're using internally at the bank uh, and together with the commission to um, to implement this is uh, is uh, well proven in the sense that the bank has been doing this uh, kind of um, a joint facilities with the commissions um, actually since since uh, 2007 and maybe even earlier and it's basically um, consists on a dedicated team uh, within the bank um, that also builds on the on the expertise and capacity of other experts in the bank that might might be be calling into into help in specific assignments. So it's mostly mostly um, in-house expertise that the bank would provide um, to work on these projects, with also the possibility to seek external advice uh, through consultants in in the case that this is um, advisable for a specific projects for specific uh, questions. Or, or just to provide a more dedicated support in project that that we want to to dedicate uh, further. As I said, it's, it's a model that that is is well proven and um, yeah, it's, it's been working well for us and for the beneficiary for for quite a number of years now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of how this is going to to be implemented in practice, the idea is to have a bottom-up uh, uh, approach. So, so basically, we will work on the basis of uh, requests um, to be received from beneficiaries, from potential beneficiaries. Um, we have a dedicated um, email address at the bank for that, and there is a form that is about to be finalized, if I if I understand correctly, uh, for for the beneficiaries to 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 describe. Um, their potential project, describe the objectives, describe basically the type of uh, assistance that they will seek, and this will be used to um, to for the bank uh, together with DGNR to screen uh, assignments and um, and then to to come with a list of assignments that will be finally uh, 
um, retain for for further support uh, from from the facility. So um, so the, the the final decision at the end. I mean, the screening is done jointly. The final decision at the end is taken uh, by by DGNR. And there is um, the, the dedicated uh, page where there will be more information uh, on on the process and and on the documents and, and as I mentioned also the the um, the, the application form that uh, could be used to to initiate the process um, uh, within the bank. So the the team is pretty much um, put it in being put in place uh, at the moment. And and we're going to start uh, the activities very soon. So you need to to stay tuned. And as, as we probably see in the next slide, if, if we move, um, you need to stay tuned. Uh, and uh, and we are very um, uh, eager to receive the first application from potential beneficiaries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. And we move on uh, because we have uh, another call for applications, which is starting already today which is for the EU exchange program for coal regions. So I will pass the floor to Sarah Gül, who is leading this project for us uh, 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 at Guidehouse. So Sarah, please. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and a warm welcome also from my side uh, to the launch of the EU Coal Plus Regions Exchange Program. Um, as I said, my name is Sarah Gül. I am a managing consultant Guidehouse and we do the project jointly together with EFOC, ICLA Europe and Wuppertal Institute. This should be followed now by a video, if I'm not mistaken. So please go ahead. Throughout its history, the energy sector has always been at the forefront of breakthrough innovation. And as the shift to clean energy gains momentum, it is vital that we move forward with a shared vision. The European Green Deal is Europe's new growth strategy. It will cut emissions while also creating jobs and improving our quality of life. Now is the time to create new alliances and embrace opportunity. Exchange EU is an exchange programme for coal, lignite, peat and oil shale regions in transition in the EU27 member states. The exchange brings together regions from across the European Union to share their insights on a range of topics around the transition process. Creating a unique opportunity for dialogue, cooperation, peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange of experiences and good practices. The multidisciplinary program matches transition regions through bilateral and multilateral exchanges, designed to deepen their understanding of each other's challenges. Whether you are just beginning your clean energy transition journey or are more advanced in the process, stakeholders from a wide variety of backgrounds are encouraged to apply to take part in the exchange to help leverage the unique learnings of each region. Creating a roadmap for the future and becoming a catalyst for clean energy, socio-economic and environmental change. Exchange EU. The change starts here. So welcome back after this uh, nice video. The video did a very good job in setting the scene and providing the context of uh, where this exchange program comes in. Next slide, please. I will now in my presentation go a bit deeper into the details of why are we actually doing this exchange program? What do um, participants get out of the exchange program? What do you need to do to apply to the exchange program? And um, any other information that you can find on the exchange program. So first of all, um, we are looking at coal plus regions. By coal plus, we mean coal, lignite, peat, and oil share regions in the EU that are facing similar challenges in their transition from fossil fuels that are of economic but also social nature. 
And as part of the Coal Regions and Transition Initiative, representatives have expressed their interest in having closer exchanges with other regions facing or having faced similar challenges and um, to deep dive into specific issues to, uh, to jointly learn about the details of successful approaches and to, of course, ultimately tailor them to their own situation. And this is where Exchange EU, the um, EU Coal Plus Regions Exchange Program comes in. It aims to facilitate the mutual learning between the EU Coal Plus regions. It's embedded in the Coal Regions and Transition Initiative and implemented in close cooperation with the Secretariat. Next slide, please. What do you get out of the program? You will benefit from various um, points, of course, here just to name the four overarching benefits. First of all, we've really aimed to design the program in a very demand driven way. So we really make sure that the activities are tailored to the needs of the participating regions. This goes hand in hand with the fact that we aim to facilitate the identification and adoption of innovative and customized solutions for every participating region. We want to provide hands on learning opportunities really on the ground to facilitate the process of going into implementation. And ultimately, the program also supports the opportunity to create a community and network of practitioners that last beyond the duration of the Exchange EU program. Next slide, please. What do you need to do now to join the Exchange EU program? First of all, we strongly encourage you to get an understanding of what really your interests and needs are to participate in the Exchange EU program. For example, do you have a certain knowledge or good practice, practice example in your region that is really worth sharing with other regions? Do you have a repurposed coal mine or a really um, successful innovation hub? Or you have really um, done a good job in implementing participatory processes um, with stakeholders and citizens in your region? Or you want to learn from others, you need input and knowledge, knowledge to develop project ideas, or you want to learn on the job how to establish a governance structure to provide structural support to the region. Or you want both. All th these three aspects can be a legitimate uh, reason to apply to this program. As a next step, coming from these um, interests and needs, um, we encourage you to build your group or your coalition to apply. This can be one person if we're looking at on-the-job on learning, it can be a delegation. And if you choose a delegation, a group of stakeholders, we encourage you to choose stakeholders that come from a variety of backgrounds. Third, we encourage you, if you have a region in mind that you would like to be matched with, to approach that region and apply jointly together. This would definitely increase the chances of um, being matched in the end. And last, of course, apply. Please apply by the 14th of January 2022 via EU survey, where you find both the individual and joint application form. Next slide, please. We have a lot of resources available already where you can find information on eligibility, on the application and selection process, and on the actual implementation of the exchanges. First of all, we are actually present at this event in, in the form of our booth or Exchange EU information stand. You may have seen it already on the front page or in the on the home page of the event, where we are at your disposal in selected time slots, but actually in any, any time via the chat function. You find a lot of resources there already, which you also find on our program website. Um, for example, a leaflet that promotes the exchange pro program so you can take it along to your stakeholders and gain their interest. Um, an FAQ, which already provides a lot of answers to many questions you may have um, about the program. An executive summary of the program that also supports you in um, promoting the, the program because it's available also in eight different languages, so you can take it along to your stakeholders. And lastly, um, application forms are also available as separate PDFs for your preparation, for your information, but please make sure to apply via EU survey. If your questions are not answered by these resources, but are you uh, need support in your application process, feel free to contact us at our help desk via exchange EU at coalregions.eu. And as a last point for my presentation, I would like to point to a short pre-matchmaking session that we are organizing on the 10th of December online, so in Zoom, um, where we facilitate in a very low-key manner, interactive manner, that regions who are interested in this program get to know each other and could potentially identify a, a match that they would jointly apply with. This is all from my side today. I'm really looking forward to seeing you all in the booth and answering your questions and engaging with you. And of course, looking forward to the manifold applications to the program. 
Thank you very much, Sara. Um, yes, very, re very relevant, and we hope to have a lot of applications. Um, before we get to our Q&A session, we have one more presentation for you, and uh, it's about the financing toolkit. You know that we have been developing um, a, a number of toolkits to help um, practitioners uh, navigate the transition, and Yanis Boitel from Wuppertal Institute will present to you the latest one on transition financing. So, Yanis, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much and welcome from my side. Um, yes, as we are, have already here, we are uh, we have developed a current set of support materials for the initiative. And so far, there are 12 uh, current practice case studies that we have developed. Um, and also, there are seven toolkits. Six of them are now finished. Uh, there's another one, Clean Air on Clean Air, which will come a bit later this year. Um, and yeah, today I would like to uh, introduce you to the new transition financing toolkit, which you can now uh, download from the CRIT website. So it's already online. Um, there is a, the link is on the top of this page or just basically over coalregions.eu, you can access um, this new document. Um, next slide, please. Um, and for now, uh, I just want to very briefly introduce you what we have done there. Um, so it basically structures about two main themes. The first one, mobilizing EU finance, is uh, mostly giving guiding principles that we identified as the most important aspects of financing for coal regions. Um, and the second part is uh, basically an analysis of the available EU funding sources from the perspective of coal regions uh, with the aim to give an overview about which funding programs are available and which are most likely to be valuable sources for core regions in transition. Next slide, please. So going a bit deeper into um, the first section of the toolkit. Um, so this is really focusing on the different elements that uh, should be taken into account when thinking about how to finance transition measures. Um, the perspective we give here is mostly of giving guiding principles, as I said, so it's not really a step-for-step -step approach. You can just follow through, um, but it, it provides the most important aspects of financing uh, transition projects that I think should be kept in mind before diving deeper into the details. Um, and I just most, mostly want to um, provide you with three of the main messages here. Um, and the first one is actually that uh, from a regional perspective, um, the, the or like kind of a meta perspective for transition financing, one of the really key, the key elements here is um, to, to have a funding strategy that is also part of a general just trans or transition strategy. So having a, a proper planning and embed that into the overall goals of a transition is really key here as it, it, it will be uh, also the most effective way. Um, and it is and it, it will be valuable to also develop then the projects um, uh, on a strategic in a strategic way and not just have some uh, some some lighthouse projects that but uh, which will in the end not really benefit the overall transition um, and the the other the, or the second point the second message I want to raise um, is and this is also something we have heard a lot from our stakeholders in the region um, that they find it very valuable to, or that, it, that there's a great need for uh, expert knowledge and um, and uh, capacity or uh, capacities for finance mobilization. Um, so from our side, it's really crucial to build these institutional capacities and have some form of expert knowledge for finance mobilization. Um, and for that, also, what we have be, what we have heard before, so therefore the tar target program uh, could be quite beneficial for the regions. Um, but also, there's several other support schemes that we are also showing uh, in in the toolkit. And the third message is um, 
is is going on uh, is, is dealing with that we would really encourage to make sure to make a good of combination between EU national and private funding. Uh, and one example you can see here on the right side, um, which shows the overall strategy and combination of funding sources in the Hungarian Life IP North HU Trans project. We are also um, we are also having that as a as a little case in the toolbox itself in the toolkit itself. Um, and it, this is, I think, is a very good example because it um, combines different funding sources, but also embed these into um, an overall financing strategy. So, um, yeah, this this would be, I think, a, fair, a good thing to look at um, when thinking about what could be a finance approach. Um, yeah, but also what we've heard before. Um, uh, from our Greek colleague about the TGTP planning that already sounded very, um, uh, very well done so far. Um, so this is all what, what I wanted to uh, show you from the first part of the toolkit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the second part of the toolkit, um, this is basically gives, a, uh, gives an overview about the most important funding programs which we have identified as relevant for coal regions. Um, and here you can also already see uh, an overview also which uh, with the funds we found especially relevant for coal regions, but you can um, generally say that all of these funds we have um, pointed or that we give advice on in the toolkit that they could be a good source for uh, transitioning projects. Next slide, please. And uh, this is just how it will look like in the toolkit. So we have um, each funding program. We present the most important facts, um, provide some info um, on, or, and also a link on how to apply for the funds. And we also always gave an example uh, for uh, where these where these funds have been already used in the coal region um, so far. Next slide, please. And yeah, thank you for listening. Um, and as I said in the beginning, the toolkit is now available on the website coregions.eu. And if you have any questions that could not be answered, feel free to contact me um, or also get in touch uh, with questions on Slido right away. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Yanis. Um, and many thanks to all the speakers. So. Um, I hope um, our participants uh, found this update uh, relevant and interesting. Um, we still have some questions and we still have a bit of time. So I will go straight to the questions. So we have one question uh, to our three panelists from member states. And the question is, uh, could you give us an, a concrete example of when and how you have involved uh, the, the local actors and workers in your planning? I mean, you all spoke about it, but if you, if you could give us a concrete example, please. Who would like to start? <laughs> well, I can start. Ali, oh, I am. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> no, no, okay. okay, thank you. Um, I think we are the, the, the closest to the, the local communities and uh, the local workers here in uh, in Gorge County because we represent the uh, uh, one county we're not at, uh, at uh, country level. Uh, so in specifically, we started consulting and um, um, involving the local community and the local business community, especially uh, in uh, April uh, this year. In, during April and um, uh, May uh, 2021, we had that uh, public survey we, we talked about. And we tried to uh, disseminate the information all over the country to all of the um, major uh, media channels we had, TV, radio stations, uh, internet, and, and so on. So we tried to um, spread the news about JTF and what, um, 
investment possibilities we have and also uh like i said try to get the ideas uh, not just ideas um because we had some uh, uh, sheets of uh, uh some forms they they have to um, uh to complete in order to um, uh, to gather the information so we are still involving them because the next step will be to uh make some sheets that are more mature or more closer to uh to a mature project and we are going to launch another campaign in probably at the beginning of uh, 2022 uh so when the uh, the funding will be uh, uh almost ready the jtf will be approved and um, uh the funds will be available the people who want to invest and want to apply for these uh, these projects will be um as close as possible to a final project so we're trying to accomplish or trying to get a better um, or the best um, uh, working process between public administration and um, the business sector and local communities. Okay, thank you, Alain. Over to you, Peter. Yes, thank you. As I mentioned, uh, within the structure of the ITIs, uh, the partnership councils, we have uh, this institutional thematic working groups for JTF and these are broad working groups where we invited also representatives from NGOs such as uh, the Friends of the Earth, it's a similar association such as uh, Greenpeace here in uh, Slovakia. Uh, we have business uh, uh, associations, uh, we also have businesses themselves, especially the large ones such as the mining uh, company included in the in the in the working uh, group. These working groups actually take place on a regular basis uh, once uh, once a month where we provide the update where we made progress and what to further expect. So, so they are well informed and uh, they can further spread the, the information. What is also an important channel is uh, the direct involvement of our political uh, level in the just transition. We have visited the regions together with the deputy prime minister and the prime minister, as well as together with uh, Commissioner Ferreira when she was here uh, in Slovakia for her official uh, visit uh, in June. So uh, she also held uh, numerous uh, meetings and uh, uh, discussions with local representatives, especially the uh, regional president, uh, but also with the mayors of uh, the cities that are uh, included in the eligible uh, regions. So there is an ongoing and regular uh, discussion going on on this level, but also uh, I would say on the on the lower level related to the youth. Uh, we are trying to discuss this together with the f with the next generation on how they um, um, how they um, uh, imagine their life in in the in um, in the future in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, we just ran out of the time for this event, uh, but uh, I would still like to go through the remaining two three questions. So if please you can stay with us, we'll be very happy. I'm sorry that we uh, exhausted our time. Uh, there is no special conclusion, so if you need to um, um, in disconnect now, you're not going to miss anything. Um, so, uh, turning now to Alexandra, could you give us example from Greece? Thank you very much. Uh, example about the consultation, the public consultation of our planning. Uh, okay, uh, as I had in my set of play slides, uh, all the uh, planning text that we have that we have prepared. Uh, the just transition development plan, uh, the three territorial plans, as well as uh, the just transition development program, all of them uh, were launched in public uh, on public consultation. Uh, and um, re regarding this theme, uh, uh, at uh, during tomorrow's uh, presentation from my colleague Maria Pagliatti, we have more data and details on that. But uh, it was uh, something that. Uh, uh, local uh, stakeholders, uh, citizens and so on, uh, had a voice to express their opinion about the planning and uh, where our uh, vision for the next day in these areas uh, is, uh, is, is, going, is going to. Thank you very much. Um, and I have one more question to Peter uh, from Slovakia. Um, whether you have already identified fields, I mean, it's also picking up what you said actually, in which upskilling and retraining, so have you identified fields 
in which upskilling and retraining is required so that people can find jobs locally? Mm -hmm. Well, there is right now this specific discussion about where we should focus the resources from JTF on the skills, because there will be a lot of investments related to skills uh, Slovakia wide from the structural funds and we need to find this um, these uh, border lines between which skills will be supported from JTF and which skills from structural funds. So this is an ongoing discussion, but what we would like to focus on is um, uh, digital digital skills uh, for sure uh, and, uh, and uh, new, new skills related to new areas of uh, specialization. So uh, uh, for for the former miners, for instance, machinery. But there is an ongoing discussion about very specific areas that should be supported from structural funds from the RRF because there is a particular measure also on skills from in, uh, in the RRF and the DJTF. So it's quite a complicated uh, matrix. Thank you very much. And and we have a question on a concrete. Um, how concrete financing will be spent in Greece. Uh, so to Alexandra, what are the specific strategic investments on which the 325 million um, of EIB, here I'm not sure I'm saying it right, will be dedicated? Um, thank you. Uh Yes, well, I also I referred to this issue on my presentation. Um, the MOU that was signed between uh, EIB and the Greek uh, Ministry of Energy and the Environment uh, is directed uh, to public uh, projects and investments uh, in the in sectors uh, like uh, rail and rail projects, uh, water infrastructure, water uh, networks, uh, and so on. And um, where uh, and these are investments that are not eligible under the uh, Just Transition Program. Uh, so uh, this um, this money will direct uh, uh, to those uh, to, to this kind of uh, investments. Thank you, Antonio. Is there anything you would like to add on this one? No, I mean uh, that is the, the bank has a very long-standing, ongoing cooperation with a lot of with the member states, basically. So this is just part of it. I mean, um, just in in many cases, just to reaffirm or commitment to, to supporting certain type of projects where we, we signed this, this MOUs and just to make sure that, you know, that it's clear that we are there when, when needed. I mean, the, um, the, the projects could be, uh, well, we have a, a long list of projects that can be eligible on the, on the, in, 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 in the specific case of energy under the energy lending policy, regardless if they qualify on the just transition or not. So I'm pretty sure we can find a lot of projects to, to, to finance the, that we feel within this um, uh, agreement that this is the MOU. Thank you very much. And, and then I have a last question, which is a bit specific uh, to Alexandria. It's about the special urban plans and what is the timeline for finalizing them and when will it be they submitted to public consultation? Well, uh, According to the existing timeline, uh, the drafting of the special urban plans uh, will start uh, at the beginning of uh, 2022 and uh, it is expected uh, to, to last uh, till the second semester of uh, 2023. Uh, well, the public consultation, this um, this special urban plans will be submitted uh, to public consultation before their approval, and of course, when the content of uh, its uh, uh, plan uh, uh, is finalized by the contractors. Okay, so I think that was a <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the answer, um, and I think with this uh, we conclude um, at the seminar. I would like to thank you very much for your participation. I have learned a lot, so I hope also our participants um, found our session useful. And I wish you a nice rest of the afternoon and thanks again for being with us and for, the, for all the useful information and for all the good work that you were sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.